And I actually like this suggestion. And the suggestion from Theo Squires is that Liverpool could do worse than looking at Ralph Ranić to bring him in as the club's new sporting director. The European Super League backers are planning to create a 60 to 80 team tournament that would replace the Champions League, according to the Telegraph. Who do we think is the better value to buy right now between Manchester United and Liverpool? If we take it that the Glazers want £6 billion, and FSG want about four billion. This video is being brought to you with thanks to Surfshark. Surfshark is an app or browser extension that allows you to browse websites in other countries and keep you safe and secure from hackers. Surfshark allows you to virtually travel the world with just the tap of a finger. As an example, we here in Ireland can afflict, uh, afflict, afflict, what is afflict? We here in Ireland can watch other countries' Netflix libraries, unlock UK services such as BBC iPlayer, and of course, that all important Spanish The Zone account for football. Surfshark keeps you safe and secure by covering up everything that you do online. When your device connects to the internet, all this information is, in a way, blurred out. This is particularly effective when you're out and about on public Wi-Fi, maybe you're in college or at a cafe. It keeps your information safe and secure from hackers. With a surf, with a surf shark, just ask surf shark. Just here, have a surf shark. Johnny? Mildred Surfsharks. Surfshark allow you to use unlimited devices on just one subscription, meaning if you so wish, you can grant access to your friends and family. On top of that, Surfshark offer a 30 day money back guarantee. If you don't like it, they refund you. It is that simple. Our sign up offer gives you a whopping 83% off. That's right. I did say 83% off and three months additional free. Simply scan the QR code on your screen right now or use the link in the description, putting in the code Anfield Agenda at checkout. The search for a sporting director at Liverpool Football Club, Paddy. So Theo Squires of the Echo came up with a suggestion and I actually like this suggestion. And the suggestion from Theo Squires is that Liverpool could do worse than looking at Ralph Ranić to bring him in as the club's new sporting director to take the place of Julian Ward. I'm not against this, Paddy. And yes, there's the United aspect of it. But this is his best role, in my opinion, is to put him in a role that, you know, is to put through the footballing philosophy at the club to make sure that even if the manager changes, that philosophy is there right through. And I think he has a proven background in this. So I wouldn't be against it. I think as an idea, absolutely. I think you have the German, the German speaking viable club there and, you know, they have... They've previously altercated with each other, um, but not. I just the I can't look past the United stint. I just I, I wouldn't like the narrative surrounding it. I think it would make things too circus like. Um, and I think that United spell is enough to taint it for a lot of people. See, I think he'd have a point to prove. I think he'd like to prove that he was hard done by it, United and wasn't treated fairly. And I think he'd work extra hard. And as you said, the German connection with Klopp, I think there'd be huge respect there. And I think I think it would work. I do make I really think it would work, but I get your point, of course, about the United aspect. Yeah, no, maybe, maybe. No, it would definitely work. And without the United stint, I'd be all over it. But I just don't know. The initial like if it was announced like all the United fans getting involved, I don't know. Just the circus around it would be a bit would be enough to put me off. But it would definitely I could see it working for sure. So he isn't the only name that's been doing the rounds. Paul Mitchell, who, of course, is uh, working with Monaco at the minute. His contract expires in the summer. And there's a lot of talk that he fancies a move back to England in the summer. So he's the other big name that seems to be mentioned around the sporting director role. Yeah, I've seen that coming through yesterday um, with his contract subsiding and the interest there. Um, I suppose any prospective sporting director is probably a bit wary of coming to Liverpool right now because, you know, people are leaving because they're not, you know, able to do their jobs properly and they're not being back. So I think th those decisions will be held until we the the, the ownership um, picture becomes a lot clearer because, again, we still we still don't know. The latest things are we're in talks with the QIA, which the, ver the, ver the how true that is, we don't know. But, yeah, I think any of the, the roles of the club will probably be on hold until that becomes clearer. If I gave you an option right now of Paul Mitchell or Ralph Ranić to come in and take over the role, who are you taking? I mean, I probably would go Ranić out of the two of them, to be fair, because I'd be more familiar with what he's done. And, uh, you know, that's his preferred role, his better role. Um, and he had a lot of good ideas at United, who, who he was linked with. So, yeah, and I think him and Klopp would get on well. And as somebody in the chat has pointed out as well, we do have history with Ralph Ranić players as well, who, who've gone through Ralph Ranić systems and ended up at Liverpool. 
Yeah, Kanate, um, Keita as well. Yeah, he's a good eye for talent. You could maybe get him, get it, get to put some good words in there with Leipzig and get Gvardi all over the door, over the road as well. Um, true. No, it would make a lot of sense. There's a lot of match up there. It's a shame he's ta been tainted by United, but we could wash, we could wash that out of him. But also, if Liverpool ever wanted to go down this model of a multi-club model with Liverpool at the top of it and a pyramid of clubs underneath, again, Ralph Ranić has history of working in those type of organisations with his time at Red Bull as well. So you can see why you tick a lot of boxes anyway. Yeah, again, I'm all, I, yeah. Do you know what? I'm, I've, I've been, you've, you've wooed, you've wooed me. I'm, I'm, all, I'm, 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 I'm getting over the United factor on. Yeah, Ralph's tricky Reds. Let's go, part two. Yeah, the two for me that I'd always seen mentioned before he went to United as well was, was Ralph Ranić and um, the the other lad that, that managed the Dutch national team, uh, Louis van Gaal. His name was yeah. mentioned as a potential sporting director. Now, of them two, I think I think Klopp would work better with Ranić than Louis van Gaal. I think Louis van Gaal would probably be a little bit too uh, boisterous for Klopp. Oh, yeah, Klopp and van Gaal would be at loggerheads for sure. You know, definitely... Clash of the Titans there. Van Hal's a serious character, but no, absolutely not. Jesus Christ. So what do you think, chat? What do you think about this? Let's go and get some comments now from the chat and see if they agree. Would they take Ranić? Would they not take Ranić? Uh, never mind, that's Phil Mitchell, somebody said. He does look a bit like him there. Um, Paul Mitchell, he looked a little bit of the Phil Mitchells about him, but a bit more professional, I think. Um, okay, Connor said this press was brief that Julian Ward was leaving because he wanted a break and now he's about to take Ajax sporting director job. Well, on that, he can't, he can't take any job when he leaves Liverpool for a year. That's part of his contract, from what I've read. There is a no compete clause there for one year, so we'd have to take a break or work somewhere else for a year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that was funny though when that when that was that he's taking a break and then he's been linked with Ajax straight away. Um, but yeah, I heard about that. There's a, like a year where he can't call someone directly because obviously that would be, uh, you know, there'd be too much um, uh, overlapping. So yeah, sorry, Julian, pal. I take it. Oh jeez, I, mean? I, I fuck. I, I was like, what happened there? Yeah, I, listen, could they afford you though? Do you know what, Paddy? Honest to God, I'm I'm fully expecting us to be chewed away from Anfield when we're over there, but not allowed in for all the shit I've said about John W. Henry. Can you imagine? Imagine it was John himself just sitting there with a handgun. Now, Craig, who's chatting shit now, huh? Fuck him. Ah, I'd, I'd actually... I'd, I'd, actually oh. I'd cry. Can you imagine? Not actually allowed in for the game. I'd probably cry. I'd cry. I'd be really upset about it. I'd be really pissed off about it, but then I'd be thinking of all the publicity I'm about to get from it. Yeah, I'd get my phone out straight away and just fought, throw myself to the ground like, oh, John, he hit me. What? No, I didn't. I'm so... He's lying. Shut up, John. He did, John. We all seen it. Everybody here hates you, John. You're in the wrong place here, mate. Um, yeah, I don't know. So let's start off by reading something from The Telegraph, Paddy, which will give people an explanation of, of what we're potentially looking at. So The Telegraph have written, Real Madrid, Barcelona and Juventus have contacted more than 50 clubs in a bid to launch a new European club competition to replace the Champions League. The European Super League backers are planning to create a 60 to 80 team tournament that would replace the Champions League, according to the Telegraph. The project would include a multi-division competition of 60 to 80 teams with no permanent members and a minimum of 14 games per club per season. A22, which is a company that was formed to sponsor and assist with the creation of the Super League, has consulted with clubs across Europe since October. Now, one part of this that is very interesting to me, Paddy, is they go on to speak about, uh, they've referenced the dominance of England's top clubs in the transfer market and the effect that has had on Europe, other European leagues that are less lucrative television deals. So it's almost like they're now bitching that the Premier League's successful. And they're pitching the Super League in a 60 to 80 uh, team three tier competition. Sounds a bit like Champions League, Europa League, and Europa Conference League to me, mate. And it just sounds like sour yeah. grapes from Real Madrid, Barcelona, and Juventus. But I find that hilarious, um, especially from the, the Spanish clubs. You know, they had no problem, you know, signing everyone under the sun from the Premier League. You know, Xabi Alonso, uh, Mascherano, any, anyone that done a bit of something was that was signed for Real of Barca. They didn't mind that and spending the money. But now that they're out being out muscled financially, that's that's when the toys are being thrown out of the pram. Um, but no, I, the Super League is just an abhorrent idea. It would it would change the whole face of the game. And I can't imagine it will get off the ground. But Perez is an absolute rodent. And hopefully... 
he his ideas won't be around for much longer. Well, it's no coincidence, Paddy, that we're looking at Barcelona, who are in a mess financially and in need of a cash injection quickly. Juventus, who, to say they're in turmoil at the minute, is probably an understatement. And Real Madrid, who seem to be having a bit of sour grapes because they're no longer able to go out and get the Ronaldos, the Gareth Bales, you know, all these players that they could just throw money at. So, I mean... It's just basically they're just sour grapes. The Premier League is doing so well. Um, from our perspective, though, mate, if I'm not mistaken, there was an agreement reached, wasn't there, between the Liverpool fans that are on the board that they have a veto to the to Liverpool potentially joining any European Super League. So I wonder if we'll have to head down that route. But I, I did have a question for you, Paddy, on this. Well, am I right in thinking that the Premier League made all clubs sign something to say that they wouldn't join a Super League if it came back around or if I plucked that out of thin air? I do remember there was there was murmurs of that when it happened the last time. I'm not sure whether it was actually you know put through or finalized, but it was definitely rumors. But no, I, this this is why there was too much of a backlash the last time. There's no way it'll ever get going. Um, it'll never be done with the Premier League clubs anyway. And then if they, if the other clubs want to feck off and do their own thing, fair play. But that won't have any um have have any um traction to it. Um. I would hate the idea of Liverpool being involved again, and especially FSG when they came out and and apologised the last time. They they can't dare, you know, test the water with that again. Um, although they'd probably love to, it'd be a nice idea for them. What was interesting though, Paddy, is to hear that these discussions have been going on since October again behind the scenes, and I'd love to know exactly what clubs are being spoken to. Um, it's going to be interesting. I think it's something that. They're probably just trying to leverage more money out of UEFA, really, is what I'm thinking here. Because, I, I mean, it's not the Premier League's fault, mate, that it's the best league in the world. That's the most watched league in the world. You know, there's look at other leagues. As an example, Real Madrid and Barcelona have a monopoly almost on, on Spanish mm. football. Yes, Atleti have done some bits and pieces, but you don't ever really have that in England. It's a more open league, which is why I think more people watch it. Oh, absolutely. It's always been the best, the biggest league. Hasn't always been the best, I suppose. I think there was a period with you know Ronaldo and Messi at their heights where La Liga were dominating, and there was definitely no cause for a Super League then. So it's as you said, it's just sour grapes from the people in Spain that they can't keep up with the English game. But listen, it's it sounds like a huge problem. Some league has to dominate, and right now it's the Premier League. And with the amount of state funding coming in, it's only going to get even stronger. An interesting twist on this, though, is. Are Manchester City now potentially going to be really tempted by this project? Because right now, they're looking down the barrel of a two, three, four-year legal battle over the charges that have been put their way. If they were to be expelled from the Premier League, as an example, maybe we'll see them look at joining the European Super League. I mean, they could definitely use it as a, as a bit of leverage and be like, well, listen, we'll fuck off to that and get people, you know, so definitely, potentially. Um but fair play, let them go. That's bye bye. As long as they're not involved in air leagues anymore, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, this is very interesting. The timing of all of this, as I said, City under pressure at the minute and not know what the future will hold. They're, of course, going to defend all of these charges. They've invested in a top solicitor, as we've seen, five to 10 grand a day. He's going to be on Kevin De Bruyne money to defend them over the next few years. It's um, what got me, Paddy, about all of that was their, you know, the, their shock. Uh, being charged or what like us seriously really and then i heard vincent company saying he rolls his eyes every time he hears anything about it as if to go they're all kind of just playing the victim here like they're, they're so shocked like we did you see the leaked emails from their spiegel back in the day yeah 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 no i know it's great like they don't know i don't know how they can act surprised they they probably they actually said they knew it was coming so i don't know why they can be surprised um, Vincent Company. Yeah, some of them players are just brainwashed. And again, maybe from the player front, they weren't necessarily involved directly. But to to act dumb and act as if there isn't uh, financial irregular, irregularities going on, and you know, there's no way a UEFA are coming after City and the Premier League without without actual evidence and stuff. So hopefully, this is uh, an open and shut case, and the Premier League gets their gets what they want, and we have no more City. That would be great. When I think about the Super League stuff, though, when I think about who could potentially use it as leverage and stuff, I keep coming into my head about Celtic and Rangers because they're in this really awkward position up in Scotland where they're the two biggest clubs, obviously, they can't really compete when it comes to the Champions League, even if they keep qualifying because they just can't pay out the wages. So I wonder, will they ever try and leverage that to maybe force their way back in, or down into English football, which, of course, has been muted a few times before? 
Yeah, Scotland's a weird one, as you said. It's either it's it's the, well, I mean, it's it's mostly Celtic. You know, they've won ten out of the last eleven titles, and Rangers won a silly COVID title. Um, I say COVID. I know ours was, but it wasn't really. But yeah, um, yeah, it's there's no real real value in that anymore. Like though, that Scottish football is muck. You know, I feel sorry for some of the fans at them clubs having to hype up that shite. But like, you see Brendan Rodgers doing a treble, treble. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, there's, there's, there's. I have dish I have like, there's, there's, there's plates downstairs that have more, you know, uh, weight than those trophies. So yeah, no, I'd love to see Celtic Rangers get involved in the English league system, and uh, not necessarily the Super League, but they definitely could look at that. Do you think there's any way that the Super League, in any form, could really go ahead without English clubs in it? No, <laughs> no, it, not really. It could go ahead, but it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't challenge the Premier League. It would just be like, meh. Like people, if 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 there was enough of them that you know, threatened the 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 participation of the European competitions like the Champions League and Europa League, etc. Then maybe. But I just can't see how it ever gets off the ground properly. Yeah, I hope that whatever happens now, this will be dead and buried once and for all. And we don't have to hear any more about this uh, Florentino Perez-led European Super League, which is just, let's call it what it is, Paddy. It's just another... Oh, absolutely. They'll act like there's any good in it, but it's all just money, money, money. And the rage raging that they're not getting the most of it, like England. What also makes me laugh about this is the main protagonists here, Real Madrid, are... Um, the most successful club in European football club history, as it is. I know, and that's why I don't, I don't, I don't see why Real Madrid want to like leave the Champions League. It's their baby. It's their competition. I, as you said, I think it's just a, a negotiation tactic, maybe trying to get more money. Maybe they're trying to shake down UEFA and try and get a bigger share of the pie, which is fair enough. That's business, but they, they, there's no world in which the Super League ever gets going. It's just there's too much opposition to it. Well, in a little bit of good news, Paddy, we do have uh, an update with regards to players who are back training. Virgil van Dijk, Diogo Jota, Bobby Firmino and Arthur Mello all back out on the training pitch. And I believe Diaz isn't up to full training, but I believe he has started doing a little bit of running. So I'll take any positive we can get at this point, mate. No, absolutely. Listen, great news. Great, great news. Jota coming back is fantastic. We've missed him. He he was. I think we a lot of us took him for granted. But me being one of them, we were like, "Oh, he's a goal scoring merchant." Like, God forbid, how we could do it one of them right now. But yeah, no, it's massive news. Uh, I think it'll be too early for the Everton game in terms of starting, and I wouldn't risk him there anyway because uh, God forbid he gets injured again. But yeah, no, great to see this. This need these boys coming back. We need them. Yeah, surely you got to look towards the Real Madrid game now. For and look, this Real Madrid game now probably has a little bit of extra spice added to a Paddy with the Super League stuff as well. This, the, the, the Champions League is the be-all or end-all now for us because, as I said, we're not getting into the top four. We won't get into the, the, the league route, so we need the Champions League. We need to somehow pull it out of the bag and probably it, this would be a, a bigger miracle of Istanbul than the last one um, should we get there and do it. But, yeah, get the boys up to speed. Uh, I don't know how, again, I don't know how far along Diaz is. I, I don't think he'd be ready for the first leg. Uh, but, you know, get him back for the second leg because he's imperative. And, yeah, all eggs in the Champions League basket. What did you make, though, of, of the United and Leeds game last night? Because I'm sitting back at the minute, mate, and the more United drop points, the more angry I'm getting because of the wasted opportunity for us to get ourselves back into this top four race. I know, I know. It, it United are, listen, it, it's a bad result on paper, but the comeback was 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 quite quite good. Typical that they didn't lose or win. I had money on them if they if they won, and if they lost, they lost. It's funny. Um, yeah, yeah. We really fucked up this this top four race, I w and I would say it is over. Um, but at least United aren't in a title race. They they thought they were, and that definitely put pay to that idea. Yeah, I mean, even the the media around the Sancho goal, he, he's back. It was the poxiest goal ever. I just saved it. No, I yeah, absolutely. And the media were like, "Oh, Ten Hag getting working wonders, getting getting Sancho scoring." Yeah, he only cost about eighty million. What a what a hard job that must be. Honestly, there's, there's some of the dribble that comes out. No, I do rate Ten Hag and you rate what United are doing, but you don't need to like blow smoke up their arses anymore. Yeah, it was a, uh, it was, it was quite funny looking at the wry smile on his face on the sidelines when when Sancho scored because sometimes Paddy, when when things are starting to just go for you, everything just starts to fall for you. And as much as it wasn't a great goal, it was a great confidence inspirer, I guess, for for those United fans and players. Hundred percent. That's like he's someone that was cast to the side. Not people were falling out of love with him. 
that that goal can be uh, the difference maker, you know, especially as an attacker. Like, confidence is key. He could go on and fire away now. I actually rate Sancho. He was someone I would have loved at Liverpool back when he was at Dortmund. So hopefully he doesn't get back to the top form, but he seemed to be struggling mentally. So it's good for him on a human level that he's doing better. So I read something today from Neil Jones of Goal. And Neil Neil Jones has been I've been putting the cat amongst the pigeons with some articles lately. But one thing that Connor posted on the Anfield Agenda Twitter account was Salah has only scored three goals in his last eleven matches and has looked increasingly worn down by the chaos unfolding around him as of late. Uh, I, I mean I don't like the idea that he gets to use what's happening at the club with regards to the ownership situation, all this chaos. Ultimately, he's been gash. Yeah, I don't like making excuses for him. Like he, that, that article is just like, no, he is a part of the problem. Not that like, people keep making concessions for him. Oh, well, dude, the midfield is shit, and dude, he still is good enough. He should be good enough to pull it out of the fire himself at times. And he's been awful. People will look at the goals and assists. They've been, they've car- even they flatter him from what he's actually played. He's played poor. He doesn't, he's not involved in games. He doesn't offer anything it, at the moment, which is really frustrating. And when he's not firing, we're in the, we're in, we're in trouble. Um, I mean, yeah, look, I, I, it's tough to strike a balance because we all love Mo. There's no denying it. We all love Mo. We all want Mo to succeed. But there seems to be this inability for us to be able to critique him without, People getting very worked up about it. Three goals in his last 11 matches. None, I think, in his last four. And he missed two or three very good chances in the last game as well. I'm I'm just sick of the excuses, mate. He's not even performing up to his own XG. So they can't even say that it's not his form or it's not his confidence. Because mm. if, if it wasn't his confidence, he'd at least be steady with his XG. I just don't understand the narrative that you can't critique someone because they're a club legend or have been so good for years. You can you can do both. It's not mutually exclusive. You can critique someone for their performances and still, you know, respect what they've done for the club and, and give them their plaudits in that regard. But you, you can't just keep playing people and backing people that are putting in terrible performances. You know, it's just you'd never you, that's not rootless enough for what you, this football club or someone of our size needs to be. Um, and Salah has been abysmal. Absolutely abysmal, and I would love, I'd love to be able to drop him and get a right wing in there to push him. But we don't have that luxury because, of course, FSG don't like spending the money. I wanted to ask your question, and I want to ask the audience this question as well: Who do we think is the better value to buy right now between Manchester United and Liverpool? If we take it that the Glazers want six billion and FSG want about four billion. Who do you believe is the better value club to buy? Honestly, like you're looking at it. You know, Liverpool don't need a new stadium. They don't need a new training ground. Um, they're two billion cheaper. So I, I people are talking about United being the better option. Now I know United are an absolute powerhouse and make a shit ton of money. Um, I think I think Liverpool is just a, a much safer option. I think United is very volatile, but I suppose both are great. The fact that we're both available at the same time is very frustrating. I think it's definitely the United being available is hindering our sale massively. Um, which is probably why they've acted, um, because ultimately they are the bigger club, especially from a business point of view. Um, they're the bigger club, but I think Liverpool need less. So from a profitable point of view, Liverpool make more sense. Yeah, I guess it depends what you want from it. Like there's, as you said, we can't argue against United being the bigger club who can generate more cash. And people will say, "What well, Liverpool raised more money this season or made more money than United. But I think if you take away... One, the fact that United have that Champions League footballer, they've been in and out of it for a few years. And also the crippling loan repayments from the leverage buyout that the yeah. Glazers have, have took out to buy Manchester United. I think Manchester United become far more solvent than cash rich then. So I would suggest that if a new owner came in there, say they paid the six billion, you're right. Old Trafford needs to be redeveloped again. Um, they need mm. to redo Carrington. That looks like it's been stuck in the Stone Ages, especially if you listen to Ronaldo. So from that perspective, Liverpool are a club that are, is being redeveloped as we speak. The main stand's done. The only other end's been done in and around Anfield's been done. A new mega store's been built. You've got Kirby, obviously, there as well. So on the face of it, Liverpool looks like the better option to me. But I guess, I guess it just depends what you want from it. So... There's no denying if you're buying the club for branding purposes or to increase your reach in the world, then yeah, United would probably be a better fit. 
if you're buying it to try and make money from it in the short term, Liverpool is probably a better fit. An interesting one, Paddy. I think there's less money needing to go into Liverpool, but United do just make more money. And as you said, if, especially if it's a it's the Qataris or it's a potential sport washing project, you, you don't you know they don't come much bigger than United, Bar Madrid, and the chance for them to be to to be to them being on the market is is you know once in a generation opportunity. You know the whoever comes in there could own them for fifty years and them not look to sell. So yeah, I would say United are are the for what the Qataris would want the better option unfortunately, but we're so, a very close second. Surely to Manchester United fans right now, Paddy, Jim Ratcliffe is the most palatable option. He's a United fan. He's Britain's one of Britain's wealthiest, if not Britain's wealthiest man. And he's publicly declared that he's interested. Now, we know there is, what, maybe a week or two before the, the soft closing date of applications to buy Manchester United. So do you think he's in the pole position right now. Is he in the driving seat or do you think the sheer wealth of potential Qatar investment is, is the winner? I think from, for United, for a lot of United fans, they'll want to, they'd love the idea of Jim Ratcliffe because he's the safer bet. He's a United fan. You know, it, it, it sounds like the, the perfect opposition to the Glazers, but I think, I think the key, the Qataris and their money is just the one that, that the Glazers are going to go for. Um, and they'll they'll pay that six billion like as 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 you know they have enough apparently money there. They won't. Apparently, well, yeah, apparently but that's... red is four and a half. Is there is there their entry point here to negotiations? But there we. But that's that's what it is. It's negotiations. At the end of the day, they'll they'll find some middle ground. You know, the Glazers are going to say eight. They'll say four and a half. They'll they'll find a, a middle ground. Um, like we're hearing about United having application dates and you know closing dates. Fucking hell, have we even opened applications? Is there anything? Please, anything, please. Three months, and apparently, as per uh, articles I've read lately, no um, concrete offers for the club. But I did read something in the Echo that said, uh, as per their own information, they don't believe that Redbird Capital will be part of any negotiation here for a part buyout or full buyout. So maybe we could rule them out of the equation, which is good news as far as I'm concerned. Oh please, they're 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 just FSG two point They they are just even a backward step to be honest. Please God, no. We need we need to be looking at if you look at our competitors, you look at the money Newcastle have, Man City have, albeit they they're in precarious situations, and United. We need we need serious money. So yeah, ruling Redbird out is a is a great step.